you very much. Thank you. Uh, can you all hear me okay in the back? This ain't working. Can you hear me? Yeah, that's too bad. I'm probably going to say a few things to piss you off today. Uh, look, I am not the uh, charming good looks candidate in this race, as though that needed to be said, right? If I say anything today that makes you happy and comfortable and uh, feeling really good about the way America is going, you and I are failing to communicate. It turns out to be the case, we now know, that your government took money from you and from your neighbors, forcibly, by the way, mixed it with a lot of people that your government took from other people around the United States, invested it, mixing it with a lot of money taken from other governments, from other people around the world, invested it in the nation of China, in a laboratory, we now know, that Dr. Fauci says was not for the purpose of fostering gain-of-function research, Senator Rand, of course, says otherwise, but what is clear is that the money was used to finance an operation that made it easier to pursue gain-of-function research. It led to the development of a virus that was not otherwise found in the natural world. It escaped, please God, let it be by mistake. It escaped from the laboratory, spread around the world, killed a couple of million Americans, killed several million people around the world. This is a horrible story. It's a horrible story, but I'd like to argue that nothing that I've just said about that story is the worst part about that story. So what I'd like for you to do is to let me put a pin in that story. Let's come back to it. Because it turns out also to be true that your government took money from you and from your neighbors, from people inside and outside of the great state of Arkansas, mixed it with a lot of money that they took from other people. They mixed it with a lot of money that they took from other people around the world. And once again, they invested it in a nation outside of the United States. They didn't tell you about this either. It was also invested through a shell company, and it was used for the purpose of exploding a pipeline in the bottom of the Baltic Sea. This will cost the nation of Germany dozens of billions of dollars in increased costs for energy. It will, somewhat ironically, if you listen to what the federal government says are its objectives, it will increase the amount of petrodollars flowing into the Russian government. This is what would have been considered only a few years ago an act of war, and oddly, an act of war perpetrated against the people of Germany. This is a very bad story, too. A lot of bad things are happening to the people of Germany because of this. Of course, it cost billions of dollars for people who invest in the pipeline in the first place. And as bad as that story is, and it is, as bad as that story is, I'd like to argue that nothing that I've said about this story is the worst part about that either. So I'd like you to put a pin in that just for a moment. It turns out to also be true that a young man is being prosecuted for releasing secrets of the American government. If you watch the CNN description of what it was that he released, and he did so because he apparently felt that he had no choice but to either allow these things to remain secret or risk going to jail. If you were to watch the CNN description, and by all accounts, I think we have to admit at this point that CNN is little more than a mouthpiece of the Democratic political establishment that it passes through what the White House wants it to say. So I'm not asking you to watch Fox News. Just look at the CNN description of the information that this fellow in the Air Force released. What it basically says is that the money that you, again, money that has been taken away from you forcibly by your government, mixed with a lot of money around the United States, also taken from your neighbors, friends, and people whom you don't know forcibly. This money is being invested abroad in a way that will not advantage the Ukrainian people, will not ultimately serve your interests. Why is it this is being kept a secret from you? The Ukrainian government already knows this. The Russian government already knows this. The reason the White House doesn't want this to be released is because they don't want who to know? You. As bad as that story is, and it is, put a pin in that. Because I'd like to argue that nothing that I've said about that story is the worst aspect of that either. These stories that seem as though they have absolutely nothing to do with each other. The worst
worst part about them is that they have everything to do with each other. Yours is a government that operates in the shadows and does so because it does not serve your interests. It operates in the shadows because it operates for its own interests and the interests of the politicians who run our government for their power, for their aggrandizement, for their whim. Our nation, our nation's government is not going in the right direction. It is up to who to stop it. I fear that by the end of this century, our federal government will become fiscally bankrupt. My greatest fear is that before the end of the century, our government will go bankrupt and people like you and people like me will no longer feel as though that is such a bad thing. That is a real shame. We are very, very lucky today to have as many people in the room as we do. We have uh, 60? I, I don't know. Uh, but we have a lot of people. Congratulations. And I understand that the party has been growing. This is a wonderful, wonderful thing. However, if you were to take the number of people in this room and multiply it 50 for all of the conventions around the United States that are going, around, going on around this time in the spring and in the fall, you still do not get a large number. It is up to us as individuals, not merely as organizations, as individuals to stand up against the direction in which our nation's governments are moving and moving quite rapidly. If it's not up to us, it's up to no one. Does anyone in this room really believe that a Democrat is going to stand up for your rights? going to stand up for your First Amendment rights, your Second Amendment rights, who's going to stand up for your Fourth Amendment rights. Does anyone believe that the Democrat is going to stand up for your Tenth Amendment rights? Does anyone in the Democratic establishment even understand what the Tenth Amendment is? Does anyone in this room really believe that a Republican is going to stand up for the simple dignity of raising your children the way you want, the simple dignity of having a foreign policy that represents our most basic values, will a Republican stand up and say what you know to be true, which is to take money from people forcibly and use it for no other purpose than project military hegemony around the world is evil? No, that's for us to say. And you know, and I know too, that if we don't say it, nobody else will. We as libertarians are the philosophical descendants of the people who founded this nation and did so for only one good reason, and that's to stand up for your individual liberties, your individual rights, what we used to call your civil rights. Those are slipping away and slipping away rapidly. And I would also ask you to remember, as though the following needs to be said, you know that none of what we're talking about today is about me. I'm here to tell you it's also not about you, as wonderful as each and every one of you is. It's about people who are outside of this room, people whom we call brothers and sisters, for no other reason than the fact that they are fellow Americans. People who are least able to stand up to the government. It is the most vulnerable among us who are swept up in a criminal justice system that is absolutely the most oppressive in the world. I say a lot of things to friends of mine who hurt a lot of feelings. I worked as a police officer for most of the past dozen years until about a year and a half ago. I'm a big advocate for police. I have a lot of friends who are police officers. But we are kidding ourselves if we think that we do not need fundamental reform in both our criminal justice system and the way that we manage police officers, because we do. That hurts a lot of feelings, but these things need to be said. And trust me when I say, a Republican and a Democrat won't say that. We're already well aware of that. I hurt a lot of feelings also when I talk about our need for transformational change in terms of monetary policy. If we're interested in running a campaign that says, as we have in the past, Inflation is naughty. We should have less of it. You can count me out. 
Because that's what a Republican says, that's what a Democrat says, that's what our party has said in the past. Americans are ready for a bolder, much more transformational message. We have institutional problems in this country, and it's time that we spoke about institutional solutions, which is why, notwithstanding the fact that I have worked with Federal Reserve economists for much of my previous career, it's time to add to the Federal Reserve system. I heard a lot of feelings also when I talk about the fact that our government is going fiscally bankrupt and going there quickly. Because I worked for the White House for a couple years as, as an economist. I worked in the Office of Management and Budget. I know the processes that have gone awry and I know how to cap spending. Nobody in Washington has an interest in doing it. That hurts some feelings. But nobody in this room should be under any illusion that anything less than a bold transformational change in the way our government does business will solve our problems. Indeed, I'm not sure it is solvable at all at this point, but I believe it's still worth a shot. You know that it's the people who are most vulnerable in our society that we are fighting for. You know that it's the retirees, who are having their asset base eroded steadily by too much inflation, that people who can least afford it are the most taxed regressively? Have you thought about Social Security lately? Have you thought about the fact that the news media would have you believe that a Democrat and a Republican are completely frozen out of talking about Social Security? Not only must we talk about it, but we must be the party that points out that forcing young people into a system of defined benefits with a guarantee of a low market return and possibly no return at all is evil. It's up to us to say this because if we don't, nobody else will. And this is why I'm drawing a bright line distinction between my campaign and not only other campaigns that are running right now, but a bright line distinction against campaigns that we have run in the past. And I mean no disrespect to the people who have represented our party recently. They're wonderful. We all know them. We're fans on some level. Good people, libertarian people, nice people. They've been nice to me. So I hope no one takes this personally. If you're running a campaign that says, I'm fiscally conservative like a Republican and socially liberal like a Democrat, you're not actually running for president. You might be doing something that makes you feel good, it might be something that makes someone else feel good, but you're not in it in a way that differentiates our party, that helps brand our party. You're not differentiating from the other groups of people out there. You're not saying anything interesting or giving anyone a reason to hang on to you, remember you, or vote for you. So please, we need to stop wasting our time. We need to start delivering the most transformational policies as the central part of our message and back that up with real world solutions. That's what my campaign is all about. I believe it is the one that represents best the interests of our party, but more importantly, what's in the best interest of our nation. It's not about us which is why I am no longer talking about 2024 as being our big golden opportunity, which is what I've spent a lot of the last several months talking about. From now on, you and I need to talk about the fact that it's more than an opportunity, it's an obligation. 2024 represents not just an opportunity, this is our call of duty. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening to me today. Sure. But we do have an important rule. No normal questions. Okay? We're only going to take weird questions. I've already uh, had the opportunity to shake hands with about half of you in the room. So don't go telling me that you're normal. Okay? I can already uh, sense it. I can tell. I'm familiar with libertarian groups, of course. And I know that some of you are harboring the weirdest. Uh, most sorry but ideas and questions imaginable. So I want to see uh, someone with something a little bit off the beaten path. Although if you do want to talk about the Fed and how to end the Fed, we can do that. Uh, but 
It's early in the morning. Anybody have an odd question? A little bit shy, sir. What's your least favorite color? My least favorite color? <laughs> yeah. Mine. My. <laughs> uh, my least favorite uh, color, I feel like, is, uh, is red, to, to be honest with you. And I think I feel that way because over the years, I have felt betrayed by the Republican Party. I started out as a Republican a long time ago. I know there's a lot of Bill and uh, Hillary Clinton fans in the room. I noticed they named their airport for them when I got off last night. I thought, well, that's good enough. That's good enough. In 1992, my job for most of the year was to read every word out of Bill Clinton's mouth. I'm sorry. You think your life is soft. <laughs> and he still sounded like a con man. Yeah, uh, he still does. He's smoother. Uh, I campaigned uh, for the Republican Party in 1992 uh, as a recent White House <coughs> economist. I thought that, uh, my boss, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, was a Republican. I thought that meant something. I thought he was fiscally conservative. And when he said, read my lips, no new taxes, as a young, dumb, you know, conservative uh, economist in my 20s, I thought, you know, what's not to believe? Uh, that's a lot of history uh, over the dam, and I got my feelings hurt, and I'm no longer a fan of red. Yes, sir. I'm trying to figure out how to properly phrase this question. After 2016, after 2020, after the hell that was COVID, after the after what we've seen overseas, the Ukraine, our involvement in Ukraine. How do what exactly are we going to? What exactly is your message going to be that? Wait, that it gets through to people after all of those things failed to convert anyone outside of the two-party system and led them to believe that the solution lies in doing the same damn thing. Yeah, uh, well, you're absolutely right. We need to convince them that, first of all, they need to stop thinking about doing the same damn thing over and over again. I think that people are ready to hear, for example, a real hard-edged uh, anti-war message for the first time in a long time. If, if you'll pardon me, we, we've, we've been doing that. The left, the, occasionally leftists do that. Nothing. Gets... Occasionally, occasionally. Yeah, uh, I mean, they shut Bernie down, yes. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm trampling on, but it, yeah. it after, co after, after the hell that we went through with COVID. Yeah. What on, and, and, and nothing changed. What yeah. on earth is going, to, is going to come out of a, out of a libertarian's mouth that suddenly, you know, what, what are we going to change in our rhetoric that suddenly gets somebody to say, you know, it's about damn time I started doing something different? You need to remind people that what our government does on our behalf is evil, and you need to use words that are just that edgy. It is not really true that the Democratic Party has pursued an anti-war message since, you know, George McGovern, uh, youngsters, ask your folks. Um, <laughs> You know, the establishment on both sides of that aisle are solidly in favor of what I would argue is a, a sort of a war machine at this point, right? I was happy to participate in and serve as a sponsor of the Rage Against War Machine uh, rally that, that our party put together in Washington a couple of months ago. I thought that that was a really interesting event, not just because it raised, you know, it surfaced a few thousand people, but because it pointed out that there are other groups besides the Libertarian Party who are out there willing to deliver this message and a lot of people who are willing to hear it. It turned out to be a good recruitment vehicle, for example, for the Libertarian Party of Virginia. We had a, a booth set up there and collected a lot of cards. I think that people are ready to hear that, not only because people are increasingly recognizing that a lot of our problems are caused by bad public policy and bad government, but also because, specifically in foreign affairs, I think it would be difficult for any American to point at a military intervention that we have undertaken recently, recently defined as any time since World War II, and say that was a good idea, that was worth it. There really aren't examples that people would point to and say that cost us a certain number of lives, a certain number of billions of dollars, but it achieved something strategically in our long-term interest. There just aren't those examples. I think it's true that the military that we have fostered and funded in this country is very good at executing on tactical objectives. But in terms of achieving things that are in our long-term interest, 
the American government just isn't good at this. And I think that there's a much uh, greater openness and recognition to that message than ever before. Please. So I think you've already driven to the room that you're smarter than our most recent presidents and have better ideas and have more experience. How are you going to- I don't say mean things about you. <laughs> you might by the end of this. Good point. How do you plan to get the spotlight? Because the position that you're running for, every American needs to know your name. And how are you going to keep catch and keep the spotlight of news cameras? Because what this is, is the popularity contest. Yeah. Yeah. And no one has been able to keep Donald Trump's name or image out of their heads, right. minds, and ears because of the media. Right. You need that spotlight. How yeah. are you going to do that? You convince everybody here that whoever is voting for a libertarian right. could be you. Is going to have a good opportunity. Uh, look, you need to get out loud, hard, edgy, and quick. Uh, my feeling is that if you have four hundred thousand dollars in the bank, you're doing something wrong. You need to spend that uh, by Thursday at two. It has to be the most edgy types of advertising, and uh, not just uh, television anymore, and social media as well. You need the conversation to start early. You need to use the most edgy terms. We need to stop uh, feeling like the word evil is itself evil. That we can't use that word. We need to touch third rails, uh, whether that's anti-war or social security. I would argue that, uh, in, in, from, from the standpoint of my particular campaign, each campaign has its assets, I'm sure. My campaign is going to be built on leading the policy because I've had a couple of careers in public policy, and I believe that that will get an initial uh, deference from certain uh, news media, especially, of course, uh, freedom-minded podcasters. You know, that group will be open right away. That's what Gary Johnson also had. He was able to achieve double digits in the polls relatively quickly. His campaign imploded after he forgot the name of a town in Syria, but it was not, in my view, because he forgot the name of a town in Syria. That was the linchpin. That was the, what started the ball rolling. I'd like to ask you to compare that to Donald Trump. You brought him up. Again, not trying to piss anybody off, but you did bring him up. Uh, I was in He's part of the conversation. He's part of the conversation. I was in New York in the 80s, so I have a long history of uh, reasons not to like the Donald. He once said, not all that long ago, and I'm not sure he was wrong, I could probably go out and shoot someone on Fifth Avenue without losing a lot of support. Contrast that with Gary Johnson. I'm going to go out on a limb and say shooting on, um, someone on Fifth Avenue is worse than forgetting the name of the town in Syria. I'm just going to assert that, see if I can make that stick. But the Donald is probably not wrong in the sense that people know why they like him, know why they dislike him, know why they're supporting him, know why they are never Trumpers. Not so with Gary. And that's why I made such a point of suggesting that we can't run a campaign that says uh, we're fiscally conservative like Republicans. For starters, it's a lie. Republicans are not fiscally conservative. They're not. So to say that we're like them is not only bad politics, it's not even honest. Uh, we are not socially liberal like Democrats in the same vein. We don't run around canceling each other, forcing each other to say stupid things just because the rest of us do. That's not how we operate. Uh, we have food fights. We punch each other in the face. I'm not necessarily arguing that's a good thing, but that is who we are. That's what we do. That is the sense in which we are socially liberal. So again, wrapping yourself up to be like the other parties is a huge mistake politically and in terms of being honest. Our job is to find common ground with voters out there who I believe do have in many aspects quite libertarian leanings, but to draw a hard edge against Democratic and Republican politicians, not to find common ground with them. That's the mistake that Gary made, and again, I mean no disrespect, but that's the mistake that he made, and that's why uh, when he forgot the name of a 
happened in Syria, and I, I don't want to let them completely off the hook. It was the most important town in, in the world at that at that day. Uh, but that's why when he made that mistake, it just all felt like a house of cards. One more. Sir, go. Who are you? Please tell us about yourself. I know that's sort of a standard question, but uh, you dropped intriguing hints about your background. Please tell us about yourself. Sure. This will be the uh, worst four minutes of your day. Um, <laughs> you're, you're never getting this four minutes back. Anyone wants to call your mother, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I grew up as a Republican. I came to libertarianism from, from that side of it, thinking that the world would be better off if free markets were able to run our uh, economy most efficiently. Uh, I grew up in the banking industry. I went to, uh, I was in engineering school. I went to business school. I went to work for banks. I eventually moved to Washington, D.C. because I wanted to wait, make the world a better place. And of course, if you were, uh, conservative in the 80s and young and stupid, uh, you might be able to convince yourself that going to the seat of all power was how to make the world a better place. Went to work for the White House and some other agencies, eventually went to work in the banking industry as a free market advocate. Uh, a buddy of mine and I launched our own business, educating bankers and other financial services professionals. We did that for a whole bunch of years. I eventually uh, taught economics at a couple of universities besides uh, the George Washington University where I was in grad school uh, in Florida. I moved to Florida 25 years ago. And uh, at some point, eventually decided that I could not any longer put off a lifelong dream of serving as a police officer. I had originally taken the exam in 1989 in Washington, D.C. for the Metropolitan PD. And, and this is probably a little bit embarrassing to admit, decided not to do it because of money. Um, just made the decision that I didn't think that I could raise a family on what the Washington uh, PD was offering in those days. Uh, that might be true. Um, a big part of why I talk about police reform is not only because I believe that we need to change police culture. There's far too much uh, violence and far too much focus on the health and safety of police officers. And I think there's far too much uh, buffer between police officers and accountability. But the other part is that police officers will be better off and make more money when we bring market forces to bear on that industry. We want a system where good officers get paid more, mediocre get paid less, and the crappy ones get fired which is why I talk about replacing qualified immunity with an obligation to carry your own liability insurance. So I worked as a police officer from age 49 to 60, which is a little bit weird, but uh, got out just to, at probably the right time, about 18 months ago. So I'm still a big believer in public service, as discouraging as it can be. And as tricky as it can be, being a registered libertarian while serving as a police officer for 11 and a half years, uh, I found that a lot of police officers had libertarian leanings too. Not only were they there to protect people's rights, at least in their head, right? But imagine anyone can relate to what I'm about to say. We all hate our employer. Uh, I mean, maybe not every day, but you know, at least once a week you want to punch your boss in the face. Well, imagine if you're a police officer and your boss is either the town or the state of Florida, you naturally resent the stupid and silly laws the state of Florida would want you to, uh, to enforce. And so uh, there are a lot of police officers who, if they weren't libertarian in the beginning, they certainly have libertarian leanings uh, at the end. And as I always tell both police officers and economists, if you were not an economist before becoming a police officer, you will be after becoming a police officer because you get to see the effects of bad public policy up close and personal. You fall in love with your community and you resent the fact that the government promulgates such bad policy that undermines communities, undermines families, <coughs> undermines individual aspirations through bad schools, bad housing policy, uh, bad welfare policy, uh, a horrifically counterproductive war on drugs, uh, an oppressive criminal justice system. It's really a ball of wax that, trust me when I say the vast majority, and I would say all good cops uh, appreciate. So uh, 
You're not getting those four minutes back, but thank you. I appreciate it. One short answer question. Okay, yes, sir. People think probably that I'm kind of fixated on this. No, nobody, you, nobody would say that to your face. So. <laughs> would you commit to stand up to the environmental fashion? Yes. And there you go. Yes. <laughs> uh, that is, yes. And I do believe that the reason for this is because, uh, look, I, 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 I'm not a biologist, right? Uh, of all the things I've been bad at, uh, you know, my one eighth grade biology class is probably at the top of the list. So you don't want me to give you a lecture on whether we're going to have big environmental problems in the future or small environmental problems in the future. Right. I don't know the answer to that. Right. right. But I do know this. To the extent to which we do have problems, I sure as hell don't want some government allocating resources to react to those problems. So that's where I am with it. Thank you for asking. And thanks for your time. I really appreciate it.